Hey guys, today I want to take a closer look at the Liberty Bell. First of all, let's look at some of the parts. We know that the metal of the bell is mostly copper, which is the same as the Statue of Liberty. However, even uh, the Statue of Liberty, as we remember, was only about two pennies thick. The Liberty Bell is much thicker than that. At the bottom of the Liberty Bell, it's about three inches thick, which is about the length of my pointer finger. At the top of the Liberty Bell, the, the copper is a little bit thinner, and so it's about half as thick as the, the bottom of the bell. This makes the bell very heavy. It's about 2,080 pounds. The part of a bell that actually makes the sound is called the clapper. The clapper on the Liberty Bell has been made so that it can no longer move, and that was done to keep the bell from being damaged anymore. The crack in the Liberty Bell is more than two feet long. So that's about the length of my arm from my shoulder to my wrist. Finally, the wood that holds up the bell at the top is called a yoke, and the yoke of the Liberty Bell is made from a tree that only grows here in America, so that keeps it um, American. So why does it matter that the Liberty Bell is cracked? Why does it matter if a bell is cracked at all? I want to show you a little bit about what a crack does to a bell. Hey guys, we've been talking a lot about the Liberty Bell and we've been talking about the fact that the Liberty Bell has a crack in it, but we haven't really talked about what the problem is with it having that crack. So last year I went to the store and I bought two bells and these bells are almost exactly the same. They sounded almost exactly the same when I bought them and trust me, if you had seen me at Michael's last year, I was sitting on the floor ringing every single bell trying to find the ones that sounded the most alike. So they pretty much sounded exactly the same when I bought them. However, when I came home, I took some um, metal snippers and I made a little bit of a crack. This is as far up as I could get. It's actually quite difficult to make a crack in a bell. So I do not recommend that you try this at home. But um, I did make one crack so that it's like the Liberty Bell. So now I want you to listen to the different sounds that the two bells make, one without the crack and one with the crack, okay? Listen carefully. That's the bell without the crack. And that's the bell with the crack. Did you hear the difference? One sounded a lot deeper. The one with the crack sounded deeper than the one without the crack. I'm going to play them one more time for you so you can hear them, but I'm not going to talk in between so you can really listen. Okay. So why does it matter? Well, the Liberty Bell... First of all, it changed the tone of the, the bell when it cracked, so it didn't make the same sound. That became a problem because that crack was getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and it got to a point where the bell couldn't ring at all. The other problem is that the bell then um, was getting more and more damaged. So once we realized that this was a famous landmark and that it was something we wanted to preserve, we wanted to make sure that we didn't damage it any further. So that's why we do not ring the Liberty Bell anymore. Although it would make a sound, it wouldn't necessarily be a very nice sound. Um, although this one does sound pretty good. Hey guys, we've, so no one who is alive today has ever heard the sound of the Liberty Bell actually ringing. The last time the Liberty Bell was rung was on George Washington's birthday in February of 1846, so more than 150 years ago. However, more recently, scientists and students have done a lot of study on the Liberty Bell. As you can see below, they did some x-rays and things like that. One group of graduate students in 1999 in, from Penn State made a digital model of the Liberty Bell. And using this model, we can hear what we think that the original bell sounded like. So the Liberty 
bell was rung many times and had already been cracked before it finally cracked to a point that they couldn't repair it anymore. And actually what we see as the big crack in the Liberty Bell was actually their attempt to repair the bell. If you look very carefully, you might be able to see that there are some drill marks, kind of like on the bell that I made and um, put the crack in. Unfortunately, this repair didn't work. And so you might be able to look at this picture and see that there's a second smaller crack that goes from the abbreviation for Philadelphia all the way up above where this picture is taken to the word Liberty. Can you see the tiny crack in this picture? I see it right here. I don't know if my cursor is showing up on the screen, but it's right here and it goes up into the word Liberty up here. So even the, though the Liberty Bell was no longer rung, there were several times after that throughout history when they tapped the bell with a rubber mallet, which is a hammer that's just got a rubber top on it. One very famous time that they did this was during World War II on a day called D-Day, which is June 6th, 1944. The bell was tapped seven times that day to spell out the letters Liberty, L-I-B-E-R-T-Y. To make sure that the bell stays in good shape, they don't do that anymore. They don't tap the bell. So let's hear the day that they tapped that bell. Strokes of Liberty to symbolize the day of liberation for the enslaved peoples from Independence Hall in Philadelphia. WIP brings to its listeners the seven strokes of liberty from the world-famed Liberty Bell. Today is... So over the years, the Liberty Bell has taken quite a few trips. It's been up to Boston. It's been in um, to California, all different places around the country. It may have even been in a train accident at one point. We're not 100% sure. So this slide shows pictures from its last trip leaving Philadelphia when it went all the way to California for a World's Fair that was held there. The officials were nervous about sending the bell um, because they thought that that travel was starting to damage the, the Liberty Bell. However, children all over the country signed a petition asking for that bell to be sent, which changed their minds. The Liberty Bell stopped in towns all over the country for children to see it. And you can see a little girl getting her picture taken with the Liberty Bell. And I see another little hand reaching up and touching the Liberty Bell. So children were able to make a difference at that point. That was the last time the Liberty Bell traveled across the country. And that was in 1915. Now I want to read a story which is historical fiction about the first big trip that the Liberty Bell took. This story takes place before we started calling it the Liberty Bell. So they're gonna call it by something else in this story. Listen along as I read. Saving the Liberty Bell, story by Megan McDonald. John Jacob limped up to the front door. It was good to be home, home to the smell of mama's wild cherry pie baking, home to the arms of his brothers and sisters around his waist. John, John, where have you been? Asked Magdalena. Mama will not tell us, said Christian. Can you keep a secret? John Jacob whispered. I've been to Philadelphia. "'Twas black as black night when Papa and I loaded up the wagon and first blew light by the time we were on our way. After days of so much bumping on the road, I felt my bones had been rearranged. I was sure and certain I would not be the same person seeing Philadelphia as when I left home." Brong, 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 rang the great bell atop the state house. That's the bell we now call the Liberty Bell, by the way. The sound of that bell hung like a storm cloud over the city, calling out a warning. 
Redcoats, the Redcoats are coming. Word spread around like wildfire. wildfire. Bling, blang, blong. Church bells rang and clanged, answering back. Make haste, hide all your valuables. Put away all the supplies, save them from the English. See, General Howe and his British troops were on the march, and sure as my name's John Jacob, John Jacob Mickley, they'd be looting and stealing any metal they could get their British hands on. Copper, lead, brass, house gutters, even people's door knockers. They planned to melt it all down for musket shot and cannons. And what do you think would make the biggest prize of all? The Great Bell. Amid the flurry, Papa and I unloaded our farm goods. We were in the stables feeding and watering Kit and June when a man by the name of Colonel Benjamin Flower came up to us. He liked the looks of our horses and, I, and asked about our wagon. Next thing I knew, we, I mean, Papa and me, I mean, our very own Mickley wagon had been chosen to help the revolution. Shh, you mustn't say a word now. Our mission was to hide something big, something important and meaningful, something as great as gold in our wagon, to spirit it away in the middle of the night and see it to safety back in our own Northampton town. And what do you think it was? Hi ho! It was the great bell. I, your own humble brother, was to ride in the very same wagon. Papa said, we must wait now till the darkest hour, midnight. Why, any passing face could be a spy for the British. I do believe all of Philadelphia held its breath that night. Not a dog's bark. Not a baby's cry. The bell waited for us in silence, like a voice with no tongue. Papa, I whispered, that bell is half as tall as a man and weighs more than 2,000 pounds, said Papa. As soon as the bell was loaded onto the wagon, I rubbed my fingers across its shoulders, trying to read the words of freedom written there. Papa told me they said, proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. I took those words straight to heart and held them there for the entire journey. Now, if you're wondering how we hid such a thing as a bell that size, I'll tell you. We heaped mounds of stable straw on top of the bell to cover it up and potato sacks and, and all kinds of things. And of all things, a lady's hoop skirt. The stable straw did stink to high heaven. So who would have thought of hiding a bell under there? We left town, a parade without a marching beat. Our wagon gave out squeaky creaks at every turn and groaned like a cow giving birth to a calf until I thought for sure and certain those red coats would find us. Papa, what will happen if they catch us? I whispered. Here, take the reins, Papa said. Think about something besides the red coats. As I drove the wagon north to Bethlehem, Papa told me not to worry. He said the Redcoats would be fooled into believing the bell, along with 10 or more church bells, was moving east to be sunk in the Delaware River. By the third night, I'd hardly gotten a wink of sleep, but I must have drifted off because I awoke to the sound of a thousand hoofbeats. <gasps> Redcoats! Not in all my 11 years had my heart thumped so louder than the distant drums. Every crack of cannon fire turned my nerves to popping corn. I leaned against the bell and closed my eyes, willing myself steady. We soon hid our wagon in a small stand of trees along the Bethlehem Road. It was near morning light. I prayed silently in my head that the shadows would hide us, that Kit and June would not start to whinny, that my rattling teeth would not give us away. Leaves crunched, twigs snapped, footsteps. Who goes there? called a soldier. I peered around a tree trunk. 
boy, you there, show yourself. Tell me in the name of George Washington what business you have here. <sighs> George Washington? I could not believe my eyes, ears. Twas not a redcoat I saw, but a soldier of Washington's own Continental Army, a patriot. I could see soldiers, horses, and wagons snaking from the horizon, several hundred wagons and nearly 3,000 horses. What a sight! Washington's army right here in Lehigh Valley on their way to winter quarters. That bell couldn't have been safer. The army escorted us right into Bethlehem where the orange-tipped trees of their own valley waved us a welcome. But four miles from home, crack! Just when I thought the bell was safe, I heard an ear-splitting sound. Papa, I shouted. There, in the middle of a square full of onlookers, came a great splintering of wood like lightning striking a tree. Then, crash. The bell, I cried as our wagon broke and I tumbled to the ground right along with it. My foot turned near the ankle and swelled up like a puffball. I am sorry to have to tell you that I did cry like a dying cat sprawled there in the mud while the wheelwright made haste to fix the front wagon wheel. Hurry, Papa urged. Anyone in that curious crowd might prove to be a spy for General Howe. There was no hiding our prize now, so the farmers hoisted the bell onto another wagon nearby, that belonging to Mr. Frederick Leeser. My spirit splintered at the thought of not seeing the great bell to safety in Northampton town. That's when the kind Mr. Leeser offered. Right along with me, you've come this far with the bell and cannot abandon it now. After the sixth night since we left Philadelphia, our wagons rattled toward home. My heart leaped high as the summer frog, as a summer frog, when I could make out the church steeple sticking out through the trees. Who should we find waiting for us on Hamilton Street but a red-faced Reverend Blummer who stripped off his jacket, rolled up his sleeves, and pulled up loose boards tearing up the floor of the Zion Reformed Church. Shh, listen close, my brothers and sisters, for I am passing this secret on to you. You must do your part by keeping your lips sealed as tight as hoops on a barrel. We did spirit away and hide the great bell of Philadelphia under those dusty floorboards. Cross my heart, that's the truth. Think of it there, lifting up your feet on Sunday as you sing your hymns to heaven. But promise me you will keep my secret and Papa's and all the good folks of Northampton town. Swear in the name of George Washington that you will never, not ever, tell a soul. Your voices like that bell, must be silent, waiting, hoping, hoping in your hearts for freedom to ring again. So I said that this um, story was a story of historical fiction. And we remember that historical fiction means that there's a lot of it that is history, but then there's some of it that is a made up fiction part. So a lot of this story is true. We know that the colonists were worried that the British would melt the church bells to make them into cannons. We know that the bells from Philadelphia, about 12 of them, were sent into hiding, but a rumor was started that the bells were being sunk in the Delaware River. We know that the bell that we now call the Liberty Bell that they called the Great Bell at the time, was taken to a church in Allentown, which they called Northampton Town. And the church is now called Zion United Church of Christ. And it was hidden under the floorboards. I put, have put up pictures. There's a picture at the bottom that shows what the church would have looked like back then. And the picture at the top is what the church looks like now. They have a museum there and um, a replica of the Liberty Bell that they ring that you can go see. What's not quite true is we're not exactly sure whose wagon the Liberty Bell traveled in. However, historians are 
pretty sure it traveled in the wagon of a man named John Jacob Mickley, which is the same as the story. And that man had a son whose name was also John Jacob, and John Jacob was in the wagon with him. We know that the wagon broke down, and we know that Washington's army helped protect them. The parts that are completely fiction in this story are that we don't know what John Jacob and his father and his brothers and sisters said. We don't know how they were feeling in the woods and things like that. That part is fiction and that was made up by the author, but most of this story is true. And it's a really exciting story about how the Liberty Bell was preserved so that we can today still look at it as one of our important um, symbols of American freedom.